This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning a couple of noted and well-recognized writers on the web. No stranger to our regular listeners is Charles Hugh Smith, publisher of the website of OfTwoMinds.com. Also joining us today for the first time is Lance Roberts from Houston. He's been featured on CNBC, Fox Business News, as well as being quoted fairly regularly by a litany of publications. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Gordon. Lance, maybe we could begin by you giving our listeners a perspective on your background, writings, and uh, and current involvements. Sure. My background is basically that I've been involved in investment, investment banking, and finance really for almost 35 years now. Um, after I graduated from university, I actually spent quite a few years, about 15 years, living abroad overseas. Um, doing investment banking, real estate, private investment transactions, and private money management for high net worth individuals. I came back to the United States in the late 90s, opened a broker dealer here to continue to facilitate some of the uh, finance opportunities that I was working on. Uh, sold the broker dealer in early 2001 and moved into the straight uh, registered investment advisory platform because I kind of saw where the world was going to. At that point, uh, in 1999, I was talking about the onset of a secular bear market. That was a very unfavorable opinion at that point. So moving into the RIA business gave me a better platform to begin writing, and I've been producing a weekly newsletter uh, that we publish every week off of our website um, since 2001, talking about secular cycles, long-term investing, and more importantly, focusing on the risk to investors. And my basic premise and my basic philosophy is about how money really works. And, you know, we, we get tied up into the markets a lot of time and looking at the real short-term day-to-day views. But my focus is really on true long-term investing, how to invest capital, how to make it work, and how to make it grow. And I, I, I live what I preach. A lot of my investments are not only in the markets, but also in private enterprises. I do a lot of private investing. I own three different companies that um, are involved in oil and gas because they are truly long-term profitable businesses that invest in real assets. I, I'm a big believer in investing in real assets for the long-term approach to growing money. Would you classify yourself as an Austrian economist in that regard? Um, absolutely. Um my basic belief is when you look at economics and you look at the way, the, uh, again, kind of looking at the way money really works, um, as anybody knows, you cannot grow capital through the use of debt. And at some point, the debt service that is required by owning debt eats into the profitability. It erodes the profitability of whatever long-term investments that you're trying to make. And this applies to economies as well as businesses. If you run a highly leveraged business, it will erode your profitability of your business. And, of course, if anything ever happens to your business, the debt service then forces the business ultimately to bankruptcy. This happens the same thing with economies throughout history. It's been proven over and over again. If we look at the last 800 years of history and really even go further back to the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the French, the British, um, all the way up through time, we see that time and time again, every major civilization throughout history has collapsed because of economic missteps and and missteps of fiscal policy that have have been through the use of debt, which eroded their ability to grow their economy. I, I would definitely be classified as an Austrian economist, but I'm not a pound the table type. Yeah, we really confuse growth with uh, with wealth creation and where wealth comes from, and maybe our GDP formula. Because you know, I can tell that you ran or very close to balance sheets and P and Ls of companies, um, just in some of your comments. But you know, to me, wealth you can only grow it, you can only mine it, or you can only build it. You can't print it. Mm-hmm. And and when you lever when money and that is a, is an intermediation 
process for representing that. And when you start to build leverage in it, there's a cost, obviously, interest that goes with it that starts to erode how capitalism works. And that is the creation of investments through savings. And yep. it's just, it's just a natural, it's, it's, it's simple mathematics when the debt get and the leverage gets excessive. And I don't think any one of us right now, uh, don't believe that it is truly excessive. And that's a natural process. And then there's a purging that's required because it brings in malinvestment and mispricing part of the business cycle. And when that purging or correction is happens, then reinvestment starts to happen. Unfortunately, Lance, I think our new system, uh, where politicians won't allow that to happen for various reasons doesn't allow the system to correct. And we're really, we're, we're crippling capitalism in many ways. I'm not trying to be a purist here, just a comment. And I absolutely agree with you. You know, for some reason, in the, really since the turn of the century, the R word, you know, having a recession is now something that seems to be, you know, to be shunned. It's, 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 you know, on the verge of becoming a four letter word. Don't say recession. That's horrible. You cannot have a healthy economic system, period, uh, uh, regardless of where you are in the world or what type of political structure you have, whether it's communistic or socialistic or capitalistic. You cannot have an economic system that isn't uh, that isn't allowed to self-correct at some point because you have to reduce those excesses. Otherwise, you wind up with major crashes or complete collapses, uh, depending on what type of society you're looking at. Precisely. Charles, you were going to say something? Um, just I th- thought that uh, what we're really talking about is the erosion of the fundamentals of the U.S. economy. And um, mm-hmm. so when we start talking about recession, that's that's what I see is um, we're talking about the uh, self-correction that's been postponed apparently indefinitely. But we're also talking about the erosion of the fundamentals of, mm-hmm. of free market capitalism. Charles and I asked Lance to uh, to join us this morning because um, – We've done many shows on the U.S. economy and the underlying structural issues of employment, growing inequalities, reduced disposable incomes, soaring education, and I can go on here, but they all come down to how well the United States economy is performing. And what we wanted to talk about specifically here this morning, and we'd be kind of nibbling at it, is there a U.S. recession? on the horizon, or in fact, is there a possibility that we're already in this area? And Lance has been prolific in writing in this area, mm-hmm. and so I was hoping we could share some of your thinking here with our listeners. And sure. Lance has brought some great slides, and I'm going to turn it over to him to take us through some of these slides and his views. But just as a point, I have up here now, we've released a 48-minute video with some 36 slides to our subscribers, and it will soon be available on the site, open to the public, specifically on whether we're in a recession. But it goes at it from a lot more. The credit indicators, term structures, credit and collateral transformations are specifically telling us uh, and what's happening versus what we'll be talking about more economic indicators here the, this morning. Charles, you also additionally just put out a, a well, number of papers, but one called Real Personal Income points to recession and had a great chart I think you got from one of your um, your subscribers. Any comments on that one? I think it, it uh, mirrors uh, some of Lance's uh, charts that we're, co- uh, that we're going to look at today as well, which shows that um, real personal income, meaning adjusted for inflation, um, if you take away the government transfer payments, uh, it's already below the zero line. In other words, real personal income is declining. And, of course, uh, common sense would tell us this is uh, correlates to recession because people have less money to spend, invest, and, and um, so therefore you get a recessionary economy. Exactly. Lance, I have your first slide up right now. Could you take us through it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I want, I'd like to, to start, if you don't mind, just a real quick um, com- comment about recessions, uh, where we are right now. There's been a lot of com- I, I, when I write about the economy and and I discuss the issues about the economic status that we are in today, and a lot of the slides that we're going to go through, and particularly this first one about employment that we're going to look at, tell you that the economy is certainly not strong. Uh, I get a, I get a lot of pushback against this that it says that you know we're not in a recession. You know. It, Take a look at the indicators. Take a look at GDP. We're not in a recession, and I understand that. And, and the way that we calculate GDP was recently just changed. And this is important. This is an important component to our conversation here because there were two significant changes to the way that we now calculate GDP, and these changes were run back in time all the way to 1929. 
two things that occurred was the change to include pension deficits. Now, we understand that when we have a pension fund that the company is supposed to fund the pension with dollars to make sure that those dollars grow in time at a certain rate to make sure they can fund their liabilities of the participants of that pension plan in the future. If there is a shortfall, that's a pension deficit. And, of course, that becomes a liability to the issue. So what what the the economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis decided is, is since that pension deficit will someday be filled, well, that should account for GDP today. And the second thing that we that we also changed was also looking at the way that we are, are calculating not only the pension deficits, but also how it affects our personal incomes. So immediately overnight, there was roughly about a $300 billion increase to net disposable incomes. But when I woke up the next day, my bank account wasn't any bigger. <laughs> so I did, you know, we didn't, we, well, we had this mathematical change we didn't see any net impact to the real economy. So my comment here is is there is a big we, – we need to understand there's a big difference between the way that we calculate GDP and the economy that we all live in, which are two different things. And so let's go through this first chart. And because because Charles' chart on the real personal income less transfer receipts is is very, very telling because we have a large number of people – in this economy today that are living on some sort of government social assistance and and social assistance as a uh, on a per capita basis is is, is at the, near the highest level on record so once we strip out government intervention we look at what people are really earning charles is absolutely right with his chart is that we are at areas that are normally associated with very very weak economies my chart that you have up which is showing the uh, amount of labor that is currently full-time employment relative to the population growth is also very telling of this story. And it, and it tells of a very, very weak economic environment. When the economy is strong, we hire people and we put them to work. The, the Fed has been bent upon reaching a full employment status of 6.5% in the economy, and that is where supposedly we are back to strong economic health and and that sounds great on the surface. The the problem is is that we're losing roughly 90 million people have now moved off the roll into what's classified as no longer in the labor force. We just simply don't count them anymore. Well, there's a big fallacy here because in the old days we only had 26 weeks of unemployment. So after 26 weeks of unemployment, you lost government support and you were either really unemployed and had no income or you went and found yourself a job. Well, we've been extending those unemployment claims for 99 weeks. Well, we stopped counting people that are unemployed after 52 weeks. So we have people that are simply collecting unemployment checks that we no longer count anymore. We just assume, well, well, they're never going to work again. So when we look at the, the employment statistics, it looks like we're headed towards full employment, and the Fed will certainly potentially be able to claim that they achieved their goal of 6.5%. But it doesn't mean that we're going to have a healthy, well-balanced economy. We're going to have a lot of people that are simply living on social government welfare. That's not indicative of a strong economic environment. What this chart shows you, this first chart that, that we're talking about here, is what I call an effect of labor hoarding. Um, just yesterday, we saw jobless claims fall, and the media was – headlining everywhere, jobless claims fall, and this is a, a sure sign that the economy is on recovery, and so now the Fed can start tapering their monetary easing because the economy is back. But this chart shows you something that's very, very different, which is that companies are simply just running out of people to lay off. Now, remember, the only way you can file a jobless claim is that, uh, and it be a first-time jobless claim filing, is that you have to either be fired or terminated from your job. If you quit, you can't file for unemployment insurance. So when when companies are simply running very lean and they've run out of people to, to fire and lay off, well, other than Cisco, who just announced they're going to lay off 4,000 employees, uh, so we may see this number move up a bit, they're just simply running out of these people. They're holding on to their other labor. They don't want to lose that labor. So what we're seeing here and what this chart shows you is the number of people 
that have full-time jobs because full-time employment is all that matters in America because that's what creates higher net incomes, more consumption, gives people benefits to you know take care of health care and these other types of things. Temporary hires don't do that. Full-time employment relative to the total working age population because our population grows at roughly about 200,000 people a month has not grown since the depth of the 2009 recession. So we're not creating a better economic or employment environment. We're simply running out of people to lay off and fire, and then those people are disappearing into the no longer in labor force category. The thing I'd also echo is jobs are not jobs, and there's obviously, as you point out, a huge difference between a full-time job and a part-time job. But even the jobs that are out there are not producing a living standard, kind of living standard that it used to do. They're lower-paying service-oriented jobs, nothing wrong with service, but it just doesn't pay them salaries and effective disposable income we've seen in the past. So it's another level of how distorted what it's hiding beneath the, the uh, surface here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, uh, you know, one thing that I talk about a lot, and we're going to get to a slide of this in just a minute, is what I call the demarcation line which is where our economy changed. In 1980, we, we left being a manufacturing and production-based economy to this services-based economy. Exactly. And you can see, you can see a very, and like I said, when we get to the chart here in just a, a couple of minutes, it, we'll, we'll touch on this topic some more, but you can see where the change to our economic fabric began to change. So just wrapping up with the labor hoarding issue, the labor hoarding issue um, and talking about, you know, which goes directly to income growth and it goes directly to consumption. Of course, we have an economy that's roughly um, right about 70% based on consumption. You know, until you, until we get back to creating real full-time employment and, and getting a large part of the, of the working age population back to work, the real long-term sustainability of the economy is just simply not able to be there. And, and we can, we can gloss it over. We can, we can fluff it up. We can do whatever we want to do from the media, but there's just some basic economic requirements. If you want to get back to three and four percent economic growth, which by the way is not, you know, we talk about this as being nirvana in the 60s and 70s and even in the early 80s we were going between 6 and 8% growth so getting back to 4 is no real big victory but even to get to 4 on a real nominalized on a real basis is going to require much more than in terms of employment real employment and real manufacturing real productivity and real work and real wages than we currently have right now. And that is showing up, and I like you, I stress the word real. For example, the level of youth unemployment or the types of jobs that they're being able to get, the level of time that they're stuck in internships, non-paying. And what that all translates to is housing formations themselves are not at the same level. They're Kids are moving, having to move back with parents versus starting or buying a home or starting, which, which is what triggers the whole housing movement. And I think, I think everybody sort of recognize it, but I don't think we fully appreciate the magnitude of what's happening here. And when you graduate and you're a few years out and you've got the student loans, another issue, you're not ready to take on a mortgage on top of that. And th this, exactly. this is, this is the underpinning examples of the structural Issues that we're not addressing that I think are buried yeah. in, in a lot of these charts. And, and, and you bring up a very good point about the youth moving back in with parents. Um, there's a, there's, well, we're talking economics today and, and, and the economics and, and the math are certainly very important. There is another social dynamic that is occurring across our, uh, across our country really, um, since the turn of the century, which has been a change in attitudes about, uh, and, and, and about the way that we live our lives and our and our social direction. Um, just for instance, and, and and we we've talked a lot about this on our radio program that we do on a on a daily basis here in Houston. Is you know it we talk about for instance marriage equality and we talk about things such as as um, morality issues and religious beliefs etc. And it was interesting because I was out in California um, earlier this year listening to Niall Ferguson at an investment conference that was put on by John Malden. And during the Q&A section, Paul McCulley asked the question about John Maynard Keene, said that, you know, in the long run, we're all dead. And 
he says, what did you think about that? And Al Ferguson got in a lot of trouble for saying that John Maynard Keynes was a homosexual, so he has no view about the long run. And, of course, there was this huge blowout over him saying that. But what he meant was, and what his statement was simply saying, is that as we look forward, we have to, the, you know, what creates economic growth and the longevity of, of, of society in many ways is procreation, household formation, these very things that you're talking about. And recent studies have shown that our youth, our 21 to 35 year old age bracket, they are opting out of marriage because they can't get a job. And when they can't get a job, they don't feel uh, they don't feel like a they they want to get married and take on that responsibility of having a family and children and, and buying a house because they really can't afford it. They're unsure about where they are. And the other side of the coin is is the women are opting out of marriage because they can't find quality candidates to marriage uh, to marry and people that they feel that can support them. So what we're getting is is individuals moving back into homes and living with parents and opting out basically kind of opting out of our normal social social demographic um trends that we should be to create as you said and very importantly these household formations that lead to stronger economic growth i e this is the same problem that Japan has right now individuals are living with parents they're not moving out getting married and creating uh you know their own household formations and promoting economic growth and it's interesting because if we look at a lot of this we're we're following many of the same socio demographic trends that Japan is we're now experiencing here as well i just wanted to mention that um gordon and i had talked about japan as being the model of just as you said lance and um the term that i've i've seen around um that describes this is social recession and it's it's interesting because you can have a GDP that's growing at one percent at least uh, nominally, and, but under that surface of um, so-called growth, you have a social recession that's eroding the social fabric of of, of the society. Never mind whether GDP is up 0.7 or 1.1. Um, you know, Lance, I what I hear um, you saying, and and if you want to speak to this. Um, is that the productivity is, of course, the, the engine of, of wealth creation, right? And so productivity seems to be falling along with jobs and the opportunities for earned income seem to be falling. And, and, you know, uh, Gordon and I have talked about financialization where more and more of the economy's, um, growth is actually coming from unearned income and financialization, leaving less for labor and less opportunity to to get out there and, and and make money by being more productive. Yeah, no, you, th- that is absolutely a key point. You know, you're seeing uh, there, there's actually kind of two two areas that kind of feed into this. Um, first of all, from the individual side, um, we are seeing, uh, as we talked about earlier, we're seeing more and more income to individuals coming from as you as you specifically said from the unearned side of the of the ledger and what we need is is to increase the amount of income coming from the earned side of the ledger as you know basic you know the kind of basic economics is says that you know we have to produce first before we can consume we you know, we've got to go to work we've got to earn money so that we can go out and buy stuff which creates demand which creates further productivity etc well, if we're not increasing the wage base and people aren't increasing their earned income, but rather living off unearned income from other sources, i.e. the government, food stamps, etc., it doesn't promote, you know, recycling tax dollars through welfare doesn't promote long-term economic wealth. The other side of the ledger, though, is the business side of the ledger. Right now, today, we have the highest level of profits per employee that we've had ever in history. And in other words, corporations are, 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 when we look at corporate profits, we are squeezing more and more profits out of every single employee that we have, and we're doing that through the use of technology, et cetera. And, you know, and, and this is why when you call a business today, you never get somebody that answers a phone and says, hi, you know, welcome to you know, ABC company, how can I help you? How can I direct your call? You get a, 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 a computerized voice that directs you through a, a myriad of choices. Um, and that use of technology is eroding the ability to, or, or eroding the need to hire more employees and pay them more because I'm able to milk more work out of every single employee that I have. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I run a radio show two days, two two hours a day, five days a week. Ten years ago, doing that show took basically 
two different employees to do it. Um, I had to have a producer and I had to have a back office operator that basically made sure the signal went out, the, the commercials were ran, all that. I'm now down to one employee that can do both jobs and still have time left over because of the advances in technology. And so and we're seeing this, and, and if we look at um, the breakdown of where economic growth comes from, it's interesting. One of the big um, talking points in the media lately has been, well, thank goodness the housing recovery is back on because, you know, it's such a huge driver of our economy. You know, as the housing goes, so goes the economy. In the 60s, the 70s, and 80s, that was absolutely the case because housing and automobiles made up between 6 and 8% of our economic growth. Today, even with the massive surge that we've had in housing over the last couple of years, housing makes up less than 3% of our GDP um, makeup. So it's a very small contributor. What's one of your much bigger contributors? Equipment and software. Equipment and software make up almost 9% of our economy. Exports make up almost 13%. So as we've become a more globalized country and where we're exporting more of our work and using more technology to, to manufacture and do business, those are the big components that are now driving our growth in GDP in terms of the manufacturing side. So, you know, it's important to understand that, you know, companies are reducing the amount of earned income that individuals make because there's a huge and available labor pool of individuals that want a job. And the people that have a job have no real bargaining power. If you don't like your job and you don't like what I'm paying you, oh, and by the way, if you're not willing to work extra hours to keep that job, there's eight more people outside that would be willing to take your job and potentially for less money. So that keeps wage, that labor pool competition keeps wages suppressed, it keeps earned income suppressed, and it forces people to other sources of revenue. I've seen that sense, and I'll use the word of fear, of losing a job that has changed really the fabric in America. I think it's, I could use that kind of strong uh, word because what we've done is we've sacrificed pensions. We've sacrificed many of the benefits in a company that we used to have that we've moved to a contributory versus defined benefits. And we've done that in the last 12 years. That has a profound change to a society who no longer can have a retirement plan. Many people don't have a retirement that starts to change their spending behaviors. It starts to change what they're, the risk that they're willing to take, whether it's even into starting businesses. When you see the amount of money that it now costs to send their children through colleges and, and where that money is going to come from, ever mind health care, it becomes very, very crippling. And when you're in a, you know, back to our GDP, when you're in an economy where 70 percent, it's a 70 percent consumption economy, mm-hmm. that that's right off the charts at 70 percent. You can't, you may not be able to sustain 70 percent. Ever mind with the points that I'm starting to, to are, are mentioning here. And in that, you know, in this, your point of investments from, from corporations who are clearly not, the CapEx has been steadily plummeting in the, mm-hmm. in the United States. Small business has been falling off. The real growth in the GDP formula, um, is government spending. That's right. Which is, which is nothing more than a transfer and it's actually simply bad accounting. I, uh, as a separate point too, Lance, I, I would argue that the whole GDP formula of even looking at whether we're in a recession is flawed. And that is, is, you know, whether we're into imputations, hedonic substitutions, all this gamesmanships of statistics. Ever mind proper inflation to know what the deflator is, I would say we've been in a real recession in real terms, if you use the proper deflator for many for a number of uh, for a number of years actually. Mm-hmm. And we don't have real growth. So we get lulled in and um you know I uh, some propagandists have said, if you tell a big enough lie long enough, people start to believe it. And what do you believe? <laughs> do, you, do you believe your lying eyes? I look around and I see a sea of for sale for rent signs in every industrial basin that I go through. I walk into mm-hmm. doctor's offices where I could hardly, uh, many people now I see almost like any chair because the co-payments themselves are are hurting and they don't have the jobs or the, to 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 really support them. I I'm a sailor. I see boats for sale. Our club has got is searching for members that it didn't for 20 years. It had at a long waiting list. Um, I and I could go on with things that I see every single day that says, heck with a recession. I'm wondering whether we're in a stealth depression. Well, you know, it, 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 if you look at the surveys to the sentiment surveys, of, for instance, the consumer sentiment. And if you look at the National Federation of Independent Business, which is the small business surveys, they've improved. They've improved over the last three years. 
there's no denying that. And we've improved all the way back to where we are normally at the trough of every previous recession. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's all about context, right, Gordon? You know, if we say, hey, the world is so much better, it's so much better than what? You know, what are you comparing it to? And if we look at where the economic surveys are, the confidence surveys, the, the manufacturing surveys, they are at levels that are normally associated with very, very weak or recessionary type economies. But because we're coming off such a bad blow in 2009, the, 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 um, relationship is now skewed. And so things seem better, even though we're better than we were at a previous recessionary period, and, and we're not. We're seeing the exact same type of environments. And you ask the, the average person, and I absolutely agree with your point, what you just said, is that if you ask the average American, they're not so sure we're not in a recession, and they certainly aren't acting like we're not in a recession. People, look at, take a look at Walmart's earnings yesterday. It's telling you. Um, that people are beginning to, to, you know, this, this idea of consumer frugality is continuing to rifle through families all across America. They have no way to make ends meet. And, and when price rises in terms of gasoline or energy or something, or particularly food comes through their system, it, it critically impacts their lifestyle. And this is why there's such an outrage every time we talk about CPI. There's always an outrage by the individual saying, what do you mean there's no inflation? You know, my cost of living is up 5% last month because gasoline prices went up 50 cents. You know, for the, for the real American, they experience inflation and, and economies in a much different manner than what economists report. So I absolutely agree with you about your GDP being flawed. And a major point is this attitude. Uh, we're a country that's been built on innovation and risk-taking, and that fear is really stopping people from doing that. I see it so clearly in the youth, and they want to, but they're burdened with whether it's student loans or just the cost of cell phones and the basics that they think are the basics of life to them. They just they feel they can't or are or rather are unwilling to take those risks and and it just spills right through and even in larger companies that I'm I'm uh, people that I'm talking to I sense the same thing and and that that becomes self fulfilling and you and and crippling as you as you point out Charles you were going to say something um, I just wanted to ask Lance um, I know we're probably running out of time I wanted to ask Lance for his views on the next few years um, you know. In terms of the economy, we we all what we're discussing is a stagnant economy, and I was curious if if you saw this stagnation continuing, kind of grinding on for years or years, or would we get a potential spike down as as things fall apart? Well, I, I think it, it's interesting because you know it's a great question from the standpoint of it really depends on where we find the wall, and what I mean by that is is that we're we're obviously doing things with our Federal Reserve right now in terms of quantitative easing and these continued monetary interventions that we've, we've had these in the past. This isn't the first time that the Fed has intervened like this. It's just the first time they've inter- ever intervened to this magnitude, and not only to this magnitude, but also being done globally, coordinated around the world. Um, you know, we, there's really no way to tell how this ends. My suspicion, though, is, and this is simply a suspicion at this point, is that from looking at the economic data and seeing the real net impact of these monetary interventions on real economic activity is that the best case scenario is going to be a continued struggle through economy where we kind of limp along here for a period of time at very subpar growth rates. And the the net social fabric that we have continues to be deteriorated and we we continue to create this this massive diversion of wealth between the top 1% and the bottom 99% and we continue to shrink that middle class you know one of the the key drivers that that in order to have a very strong economic society is you have to have a strong middle class you cannot have a society that exists with strength that is basically dominated by Poverty and wealth. There has to be a middle class that supports the entire structure, and we're continuing to erode that middle class, and 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 continue to 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 evaporate the ability of money to flow through the system. If you take a look at monetary velocity, it's just continuing to plummet. There is no traction in terms of monetary velocity, showing that there's any sign of real economic strength in in the country. So, 
you know, so as we look at that, so the best we can kind of hope for under this structure is that things just don't go horribly wrong. But the problem is, is that as we look back in terms of debt, and we take a look at and the impact of debt and how it affects, uh, you know, the growth of profitability over time, my my suspicion is is at some point us very much like Japan are are going to find that inevitable wall where things just cease to work and we do have another major recession at some point that eventually resolves these excesses through force rather than through choice one of my basic premises over the last couple of years has been we have the we have the ability to make choices right now we had choices in 2009 to let the banks go through a normalized bankruptcy process, fix their problems through the normal bankruptcy structure, uh, resolve their debt issues. You would have blown out shareholders. They would have taken major losses. The bondholders would have eventually been converted to equity holders, and the banks would have been allowed to reemerge in a cleaner, simpler form and and go back to doing what they do, which is providing the financial uh, support for the economy through lending activities, etc., um, instead of bailing out AIG and these others and keeping bad fiscal structure or bad financial structures in place that have continued to erode on the economic fabric, we never allowed those excesses to be reverted. Yes, you know, we would have had a horrible economy for a couple of years. It would have been much worse than what we experienced in 2008, 2009. Employment would, unemployment would have been worse. There would have been, yes, a lot more pain in the economy, but By now, at this point, we would have been well back on the road to recovery, most likely. What's going to happen eventually is, is instead of making those choices to uh, to allow the system to recover and heal properly, we've only postponed that, and eventually the system will force those choices upon us. We won't have the ability to make the choices ourselves. They'll be forced upon us, and that's when you get things like a depression. That's when you get things like economic collapse that you don't want. You know, the things that we should have been trying to avoid through proper choices and proper um, actions will eventually be forced upon us in a very negative way, and that's my big worry, and that could You know, that might be five years from now. It might be seven years from now. It might be next year. I have no idea when it's going to occur. But my feeling is, is that we're well on that path of potentially hitting a wall. Yeah, it's unavoidable. I mean, it's not, it's natural. It's normal. You need it in a capitalist system. And as you said earlier, this ugly word called recession, there's another ugly word called bankruptcy. And both of them we keep avoiding, but they're actually the medicine and the clearing mechanism that makes a healthy capitalist system work. And for whatever reasons we're, we're, we're stopping. And with bankruptcies, we're rolling money. We're hi- hiding some very, um, clear events that should move money from weak hands into strong hands and there are being broken up or whatever and uh, we keep doing it and as you correctly point out we're just postponing it we're unfortunately very close to our hard line here Lance we need to wrap up any sure. last or clear messages that you'd like to uh, leave with or give to our listeners this is something that's very important to understand and because we look you know we as economists and and we as investors and as money managers we tend to look at the world in terms of very short windows And when you look at the world in in terms of quarter over quarter or month over month type analysis, you lose the importance of the data. And the importance of data when analyzing data is to analyze the trend of the data. It, it, It is meaningless to say personal incomes were up last month. So isn't that great? Isn't the economy doing better because personal incomes were up last month? That tells you nothing because all no data moves in one direction. Data trends in a direction, and in a trend, you're going to have bounces. Um, um, take, for example, the ISM Manufacturing Index or the, or the Philadelphia Fed Index. You know, these were pointed to saying, you know, look, we've had two really strong months of recovery, and aren't, isn't this great? See, this is signs that the soft patch is over and we're back. And of course, the data yesterday showed big drops in this in this data. No, we were just having a bounce within a downtrend of that data. If you take a look at this four panel chart of personal incomes, consumer spending, personal savings rate, and overall economy, what you see is is that beginning in nineteen eighty, we have been in an erosion, the the negative trend of growth in the economy and consumer spending and personal incomes have been in a negative trend. You cannot 
break that trend until you break the trend of the underlying components of personal incomes and consumptions because, as you said earlier, 70% of the economy is consumption. So until you break the, the negative trend of personal incomes, you can't fix that. The, the reason that the economy seemed to be doing better in the 80s and 90s was not a function of better economic growth or better financial stability or a, or a greater wealth effect of the, of the population as a whole. It was the illusion of falling inflation, falling interest rates, which led to easy credit. We changed to, and we changed from a productivity based society where we manufactured stuff into a service based society based on credit and finance. That created more and more low-paying jobs. So as wages and personal incomes fell, we resorted to credit and to, to, to shore up the gap between our lifestyles and what we were actually earning. And of course, we ballooned that debt until it eventually blew up in 2007. And now we're going through this credit reversion. And I think it is completely ludicrous that people are talking about the fact that the balance sheet deleveraging is over. Take a look at people's credit. They are not deleveraging to any degree that would put us back into a healthy financial balance for a normal American family to survive. And, and, you know, people are filing disability claims because they can't make ends meet. They, they are, they are taking out student loans. You think we have a trillion dollars worth of student loans because people are all going back to school to get an education? They're taking out student loans to use them as another form of, of incomes. And so, yes, they may go apply for college. I have a good example of this. I had a client of mine come in. He took out a student loan for his daughter to go to college. She went to college for one week and then dropped out. For one week, she was in college. She dropped out of college, says, it's not for me. She wanted to go do an acting job, and so she went to California to become an actress. And he tried to give the student loan back, and the college says, no, 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 just keep it because you might change your mind. So he still got the student loan. He's still trying to dispose of it and turn it off, but nobody wants to let him do that. They all wanted to keep the loan. So, you know, people are taking out these loans and using them for personal income to buy iPads and iPhones or whatever they want and boost consumption, but ultimately we have to deal with the debt. Charles, any last uh, comments or questions? Nope. I really enjoyed the uh, the broad-ranging uh, discussion we had, and people can uh, see more of my work at up2minds.com. Lance, thanks for the time. Sorry to have to end it because there's just so much here to talk about. We'll have to have you back and pick this uh, subject up again. Yeah, and uh, Gordon, I really appreciate the time. You know, any time that I can do anything at all, I'm more than happy to do it. I really enjoyed spending time with you two gentlemen this morning, and I'd love to do it again. Lance, could you uh, tell our listeners how they could learn more about your work? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, if you go to our website, it's streettalklive.com. It's the word street, talk, T-A-L-K, live.com. It's also the name of our radio show. Um, it's on the website at streettalklive.com. Um, we have a free daily blog, free weekly newsletter, um, we talk about the markets, investing. You can ask questions, and I'm more than happy to help. Um, I try to keep a very open platform um, because I feel that my job and my responsibility is try to help all of us make better financial decisions about our money because if we're not watching out for ourselves, nobody else is, that's for sure. Oh, isn't that the truth of it? <laughs> you need to be managing your own money with some help from some, some, from some strong financial uh, advisors. Guys, until the next time, all the best. Thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you, you, Gordon. Bye-bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. <laughs>